Um, so welcome everyone. Um, I think I'm Anthony Chan, as Aaron already in, in introduced me. I'm the program head of biomedical engineering technology at BCIT. Uh, well, this presentation, I really don't know how long it will go. I anticipate it will be about an hour. Um, other than uh, Aaron, uh, who, who will be monitoring, modulating this presentation. Uh, Nikki is a program assistant. And I also have the pressure to have uh, uh, Sandeep and also Brian, who works at the Vancouver General Hospital, actually the Low Ming and Biomedical Engineering, that will talk a little bit about the, uh, the, uh, the job of Biomedical Engineering Technologists at the hospital and what's the prospect. Um, both of them graduated from our program. Uh, some years ago. Okay, so um, I'll start the presentation. Um, if you have any question, uh, you may put up your hand and then we'll see if we notice your hands up, we'll give you a time to, to ask the question or you can put it in the chat or leave the question at the very end to, uh, to ask. So biomedical engineering. Um, well, many people, right? I, I think maybe 10, 15 years ago, if you go onto the street and ask people, what do you know about biomedical engineering? At that time, I would say nine out of 10 people don't know what is biomedical engineering. Now, I think the time has changed a bit. Um, if you ask what people do you have you heard about biomedical engineering? Maybe six, seven, no, well, I won't say six or seven, maybe three or four people will say, well, I heard about biomedical engineering. But I can tell you biomedical engineering is very broad. Um, in general, what it means is application of engineering principle, technology, and design concept to medicine and biology, which is a very broad field. So um, now you probably as high school educator or career advisors, you must have heard about UBC has biomedical engineering program. SFU has biomedical engineering program, uh, New Wake has biomedical engineering program. So, however, um, well, it our program started more than fifty years ago at BCIT. We are a diploma program, not a not an engineering sort of a program to train engineers. But um, SFU started there biomedical engineering option within the engineering sciences about close to 20 years ago. Um, it's a full-time program that is accredited by the, by the proof, uh, uh, engineering association. Um, and then afterwards, UWIC started a program, which is about now close to 10 years now. And then UBC started the School of Biomedical Engineering about five years ago. So now all the major universities, even across Canada has biomedical engineering program. But as I mentioned, biomedical engineering can be very broad. It can be like genetic engineering, um, looking at DNA coding of living organism, your know, tissue engineering, uh, uh, say growing tissues, for example, skin, uh, some specialized tissues, um, for implant or whatever, you have microfluidics, which are using nanotubing, nanofluidics, like a lot of uh, things to, to design some sort of testing analysis or whatever on, on, on chem, chemical, biological uh, 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 solutions. And then you have biomaterials. So these are only a few examples of what, uh, of areas, what we call in biomedical engineering. Um, UBC. Um, is mainly focused in tissue engineering and a little bit in microfluidics, uh, genetics, and biomaterial. It's a world broad based education in biomedical engineering. Whereas BCIT, we are focused in medical device technology. Um, I'd like to show you a video if it works. Um, a little larger. Can you hear the sound? Yes. Okay. 
this is a machine that takes the role of a human in doing chest compression, right? So technically, we do chest compression for patients in a situation of cardiac arrest, where the heart is not pumping enough blood to the major organs, including the brain. It takes about 20 seconds or so to put this machine on a patient who is actively coding. Yeah, take the brakes off. It actually has been shown to improve circulation to the brain, um, roughly about 60% versus, say, 40% by manual. And the other really good advantage about this is that it doesn't impede X-ray images, all right? So we're actually able to do the procedure, the angiogram, while the patient's actively receiving chest compression. Because if we were to have a person do this, their hands would be in the way, actively being radiated the whole time. This machine allows us to work uh, for patients who are critically ill. Okay, well, so in this video, well, this was taken in the emergency department at EGH uh, a few years ago. So you see there's a lot of actions, right? Mainly carried out by the, by the emergency doctor doing CPR or whatever. In the background, you see different type of medical devices, right? The, the automatic CPR machines. In the background, there's a CD scanner. There are other type of equipment, which are what we call medical device technology in the hospital. So um, our program at BCIT is, fo is focused in medical device technology. So basically, we graduate biomedical engineering technologists uh, with the ability to contribute the knowledge and skill in interdisciplinary healthcare teams and in the development and application of medical devices and products. So I'll elaborate a little bit more about what are the job opportunity, what are the roles a little bit later. Um, now, I'd like to show you another video. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, this video is on now website about our biomedical engineering program, right? Today we're here at VGH and we will be testing out the hyperbaric chamber and checking the ventilator that's within the hyperbaric chamber and making sure that the um, oxygen levels as well as the CO2 levels are normal. So as a biomedical engineering technologist, you're involved in the life cycle of medical devices. So that involves the acquisition and procurement of new devices, as well as new device testing and making sure they're all ready to go. I love my job because every day is different. Um, medical device technology is ever always changing and evolving. It's really exciting to be able to work with so many different types of technology. Being able to work on devices like this is really interesting. So the biomedical engineering program at BCIT is a two-year diploma program and we teach them all the basics that they need to know to be able to look after medical devices. What we do is we teach them the basic building blocks that all medical devices are made from. Once they have an understanding of the building blocks, then they can figure out any device that they've never seen before. They can handle anything. Uh, my name is Emily Langhorst. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Biomedical Engineering Program at BCIT. I work as a post-market quality engineer at Stryker. You know, I'd had a previous experience in university, you know, I did an arts degree, and I guess I just felt like I wasn't really set up to find a job after that. Um, but coming to BCIT, just, you know, the, the work placements, the industry connections, the hands-on lab experience, um, yeah, I just really felt like BCIT offered the technical skills that I needed to, you know, be able to work right away. Thanks to BCIT, I have a really rewarding career that's just full of possibilities and opportunities for the future to grow, develop, keep learning, and uh, keep working in a really cool, you know, field of healthcare. Okay, so um, this video uh, highlights two areas of work of our grants. Uh, the first one is working in the healthcare setting, doing service and support for medical equipment in hospital. 
Uh, the second part of the video feature uh, one of our grads that work in the medical devices industry, uh, designing, developing new medical devices and products. So again, just want to highlight our program is focused in on medical device technology, not in tissue engineering or whatever. So here are some examples of medical devices in the hospital. Like this is taken in the, in the operating room with anesthesia machine and some endoscopic, uh, so minimal invasive surgical equipment in the operating room. Um, this is an X-ray machine, right? That takes X-ray on the patient. This is bad. This is the X-ray tube generator. This is a detector. Um, this is um, what we call a SPAT CT camera. Uh, the SPAT part is this single photon emission uh, computer tomography. Uh, which is used to detect gamma radiation. Uh, so we call this field nuclear medicine. Uh, the um, technologists inject this uh, radioactive isotope into the body, and then usually they tap together with some other substances. For example, if they want to detect cancer, uh, they may uh, tap it with some fructose or whatever that will be highly absorbed by the, by the cancerous tissues. And after it has been absorbed, it will irradiate gamma ray coming out from this high concentration area. So the, the gamma camera will pick up this uh, gamma ray and then reconstruct a 3D image of where this uh, radiation coming from, which is what where the tumor cell, the intent, how the tumor cell, the size, et cetera. And the CT, CT scanner here is trying to get a very high resolution to localize the, where the CT is. So this is what we call a SPAC uh, camera. Uh, this is an ultrasound machine, uh, handheld ultrasound machines. Um, anyone knows what it is? Oh. Uh, yeah, George? Uh, well, a quarter. <laughs> or, <laughs> I think uh, I see that. How do pacemaker? I have one here. Oh, Two. wow. I, I didn't take it out from my heart, but <laughs> we we have this for our student lab. So the heart pacemaker is when, when the heart is beating abnormally or stop beating, right? An implantable device like that will help the patient to uh, to correct the heart condition. Um, these are probably everyone knows, right? A cardiac defibrillator. You saw them a lot in video, movies, and whatever. That when the patient has some heart problem. Uh, uh, when trigger fibrillation or whatever, you can use that to uh, restore sort of the normal heart function. Uh, these are electrosurgical units that use high voltage, high frequency current to do cutting and coagulation, just like a scalpel, right? But it's more fancy. You can do cutting and stop breathing at the same time. Um, these are infusion pumps, right? In, infuse uh, fluid, blood into the or other thing into the patient body. So these are um, medical devices, right? And actually, all these pictures are were taken at BCIT in our labs. So we these are all devices in our lab for our patient, for our student use. Uh, again, there's this is these are ventilators. You heard about COVID, right? Patients suffer. A uh, lot of problem in the in the lung and difficult to breathe and whatever. So the ventilator help them to to eat off so that they can the body can heal themselves. Um, these are anesthesia machines to put patient to sleep sort of right during the surgery. Uh, these are dialysis. This this is a dialysis machine when patient kidney function is compromised. Uh, this machine will will sort of clean the blood of the patient to replace some of the renal functions. So these are all equipment in our lab, in the School of Health Sciences. Um, also, whilst you may not sort of pay attention, many people has device, medical devices at home, right? So what are they, right? For example, these are typical. Um, NIPP, non blood pressure, thermometer, these are medical devices. Now there are more, so more complicated devices getting into home motivation. For example, some patient may be doing home dialysis. So they have a dialysis machine at the home, right? To draw blood out from the body, clean the blood and reinfuse blood back into the, into the body. 
So there are more and more of these devices migrating or moving away from acute care hospital setting into the home environment. Um, this is a lady who is a almost a quadriplegic, right? Is a sort of she can move her neck, she can move her finger a little bit, but she doesn't have the strains and lots of mobility. So she needs to sit on the ventilator. Um, so what are the medical devices that allows her? Actually, she, well, if you talk about 20 years ago, these type of patient would have to be staying in a care setting, like a hospital, to be cared by some professional. But this lady, unfortunately, she passed away about three, four years ago, right? She could live at her own apartment. She lived, we quote, relatively independent by herself. And why can she do that? Why could she do that? It's because of medical device technology that help her to be in, live independently. For example, we have, she's right, sitting on a wheelchair, motorized wheelchair to allow her to move around. Um, she could drive a wheelchair using this sip and puff controller, which is a special device to interface with the wheelchair. Like there's a sensor here, on, and then she just, like sipping, puffing through a straw like this. And this is being, this, the sequence is being coded so that she can drive her wheelchair back, forth, turn, faster, slower, and et cetera. So she could go down stairs from her apartment to the street and then drive along on the, on, on, on the walkway. Um, also, um, she was not able to breathe by herself. So you know, if you cannot breathe, you will pass away in almost no time, right? Unfortunately, well, there's this portable ventilator that helps her to breathe. So this ventilator is mounted on the wheelchair and then you don't see the hoses. Actually, there are these hoses going around and then it's being hide under her turtle neck. So there's an opening in her uh, trachea so that the air will be pushed in and out into the lung. So these are medical devices that allows this lady to live independently for many years, right? Sort of like she can go around, she can act almost like a, 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 just an ordinary per person. So these are medical devices, which were called assistive type of technology. Um, now these medical devices, they just didn't come out from nowhere, right? So in, usually um, in research lab, say university or some research lab, people come up with some ideas of these devices. Like they, they come up with the idea and they think, well, it's possible we should move it to some type of industries to, to make these devices and then to, to start producing and people being used. So this idea come from the research labs moved to the industry, and then eventually being deployed to healthcare or home or whatever. So we call the first one also more basic research and then applied research and then application. So device idea comes about and then eventually will be get, get to the user's head. Um, now, our program, we graduate biomedical engineering technologists. Where do you think they, they fit into which area? Research, basic research, applied research, and application. Anyone can try? Actually, it's all free. So we have grads work in research settings like BC Cancer University or, <coughs> excuse me. And then we all have um, also some grads work in companies uh, doing development. Um, of medical devices. And then we have a lot of our grads work in the application area, in hospital, in companies like GE, Philips, right, doing service and support and of medical device technology. So a little bit about our program. Our first graduating class was 1969, when our, our program is the oldest. 
when the term biomedical engineering was not even heard, well, few people heard about it and wasn't popular. We already graduate our, 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 our people get in work in the, in the health field. Um, third, at current, well, it's fluctuated a bit, right? Currently 35, I would say 35% students are straight from high school. Some years is higher, some years are lower. Um, remaining has some post-secondary education, maybe a degree or one or two years in, in colleges or universities. About 40% of female students. So compared with uh, to some other engineering program, like mechanical, uh, civil engineering, right? Biomedical engineering is very suitable for, for female uh, because it doesn't need to climb into tunnels, doesn't need to lift very heavy equipment, clean environment in general, et cetera. Um, our program is two year, two year full time, but actually it's not two year, I always tell the student, right? It's one year, nine months. You come in September and then you graduate two years later in June. So it's one year, nine months, right? Uh, but they need to learn everything from almost knowing nothing about biomedical engineering to almost job ready within that short period of time. So it sometimes can be quite challenging and they need to be working very hard in order to, to, to successfully finish the program. So within the two years, right? In a BCIT, the academic year is 35 weeks. Uh, compared to university, university is often 30 weeks only. So we are four or five weeks longer. But students still pay more or less the same. So there is a better value for the for the for the money. Um, so 35 weeks in our program is divided into two 15 weeks, what we call academic terms. So these academic terms are typical academic, uh, academic terms. You sit on lectures, tutorial, you have some time working on labs, etc. Right. So there are two of these academic terms. So September to December is one academic term. January to April is another academic term. Then there's a five weeks is what we call practice or skills learning term. It's five week term, um, which students are primary focus on learning some skills and hands-on practical uh, know-hows. So we'll talk about this 30 content hour per week term, which is the 15 week academic term. So every week there are 30 content hours. Uh, of that, a lot of them are laboratories, hands-on type. So these are pictures of students in our lab, right? Doing different types of labs in our program. Um, Defibrator, they do testing, they open up the defibrator. In the lecture, they learn about the principle, how defibrator works, right? In the lab, they they are getting to see a real defibrator, right? And then learning how to test the defibrator, make sure that they're functioning properly, and they look at the internal constructions, etc. And then the five-week skill development term uh, is all workshops. Uh, the first year, five weeks skill development term, the student learn about, um, for example, soldering, right? Uh, making up cables and connectors, uh, learning about mechanical scan skills, for example, picking the a proper screwdriver for the proper type of screws or whatever. Um, using, learning to use simple power tools, uh, learning to use some CAD program, um, computer-aided design program, uh, doing 3D printing, learning how to do 3D printing, learning about property of material, what type of adhesive would be appropriate if you want to glue two pieces together for project or for repair, um, etc. So these are what we call the skills development workshop, is the five week under here. And then uh, in year two, during the last academic term, January term, uh, student, all students are required to do a capstone project. So what is a capstone project? Is we started to ask students to start thinking about it usually in October, November. 
right? What do they want to do? And is in general build some sort of medical devices from con uh, from the concept level, right? Going into design, going into prototyping, going to testing, and then eventually come up with some working sort of medical devices. So that's the capstone project, which is in the last academic term in the in year two. Do you look at these are some examples of capstone projects over the years? We encourage students to use the capstone project to enter into local engineering student design competition, and we have been winning lots of lot of prizes using this capstone project. So um well, I'll just spend a little bit of time on this one. Um, uh, this was a, one, one of the quite early projects. Uh, this is a client. We try to encourage students to do something that is really useful. So we team up this two students with this uh, person who cannot talk, right? Um, he has uh, the... He's actually wheelchair bound, but he can use his hand fairly well. So these students design a sort of a scanner that he can use a, a switch like this, like joystick, to compose sentences. And this is also there's built-in voice synthesizer. So nowadays, if you think about it, you can use your cell phone to create a sentence and then use the built-in thing. But this is 2008, right? So this, this girl soon built us and then he, he was quite happy to be able to start talking to people rather than, than using writing or, or sign, sign language. Um, this is another project, uh, tracking your eyes for a different uh, 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 application. For example, you can use this to control, like you, similar to your joystick, use the eye movement to simulate a joystick to work on the computer. This is another uh, project embedding sensors in inside this cast and then the sensor automatically sends the temperature the alignment if this is uh, supposed for for uh, uh, someone broke his bone I saw right and then this information is being sent out wire wirelessly to a to a phone actually a smartphone to be to be able to monitor the healing process of, of the arm um, and then just want to talk about this year, right? April 2023, there's this Simon Cox student design competition. One student project group from BCIT won two prizes out of four in this particular competition competing against UBC, uh, Simon Fraser, uh, engineering team, etc. So what they've done is um, they conceptualize, design, and build a sensor basically to Mount on the back of the wheelchair, and this is well, this is the sensor at the back of the wheelchair. This is a, 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 a annunciator at the at the front, so that the person on the wheelchair, well, who usually uh, the subject could not move, even move his the neck too well, but while controlling the wheelchair, like he could sense what is behind, right? Is there any obstacle behind and whatever? And this annunciator will, will tell where's the direction of collision, whatever. So it's actually similar to uh, to some of the uh, cars, detector, whatever. But they build this using ultrasound sensor uh, uh, transmitter. And then, well, they do everything from um, uh, designing uh, the electronic circuit, programming it, and then come up with an actual uh, working prototype that the wheelchair, the person actually or like it very much because they drive around and, and notice what is behind and, and avoid uh, bumping something like that. So there was a video, if you are interested, we can go back to it later. Uh, so that's the capstone project. So you can imagine, right? Students come into our program. They know very little about electronics. They know very little about medical devices, standards, or whatever, right? And this capstone project, almost all students would come up with some working uh, devices, 
right? Similar to the one that I we, we talk about. Now we this capstone project is in the last academic term. So after the last academic term, all the students, second year students are required to do what we call practicum uh, that lasts for five weeks. So what is the practicum is student are will be assigned to work in a company in a hospital um, for five weeks full time. So the idea is to try to get them to practice and put together all they have learned in a real working environment, sort of to prepare them to enter into the workforce. So a lot of practicum sites um, treat our students as entry level uh, people, entry level workers. So they will be assigning them with real work that they, they do themselves under supervision or sometimes they do it independently and then hand it into the supervisors. So it's a five week full time. And where, where are these practicum sites? Uh, we have a lot of practicum sites, actually over 50 sites, a lot in BC, Lower Mainland, and also across Canada. And we have also in some international sites. Uh, these are some examples of practicum sites. And these are sites usually have our grads working and they are potential employers as well, right? Uh, so you can see these are medical device companies, Stryker, Rostrom, Carriers, so educate technologies. Uh, these are local medical devices company. Uh, there are some service organization, Patterson Dental, right? G Healthcare, Philips, um, some research air labs, right? BC Cancers, a lot of hospitals in the low mainland, um, as well as a hospital across Canada. So these are all practicum sites that we have affiliation agreement with. And if the student wants, uh, to go to say Ottawa Heart Institution, they can go and spend, do their practicum over there. Any questions so far? So I'll leave it uh, at the end. Yeah, I, sure. yeah I, I, have, I have a few, but I think I might leave them for the end and we'll see okay, if they okay. may be answered as we go forward. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so we'll have some sort of discussion which is quite, well, informal. <laughs> this session. So about jobs. Um, it's a two-year program, right? We're training biomedical engineering technologists. They finish. Uh, nowadays, the job market is real hot, right? There are many, many jobs for the number of students that we could graduate. Uh, later on, you, you will hear about that, right? So uh, graduate of program is basically there are a few areas that will categorize, right? Where they can, our grads will work. So the biggest sector is service and support, right? What is service and support? We could work in the hospital, um, in biomedical engineering department, there's supporting equipment, servicing equipment. We work for say GE, General Electric, right? Uh, our grad may be hired by them, by GE, to do installation on a CD scanner, to repair the CD scanner, to, uh, 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 do PM performance inspection on the CD scanner. So these areas are called service and support sector. Uh, research and development, for example, we have grad work as striker, um, or as carriers uh, that they sort of involve in it. So usually it's in the team, right? To do development uh, on new medical devices and equipment. Excuse me. And then there's device manufacturing. So they go into a place, they manufacture uh, a company that may manufacture medical devices, but it's not you, what you think about. They sit there and they do soldering and, and put together assembly or whatever. Most of our grad work in device manufacturing are, are mostly doing the quality assurance uh, task, which makes sure that the production line uh, meet the quality requirement, the end products are, are, are well and and with very little defects and et cetera. So they are doing the quality, quality design and control. And then there's sales and marketing. Usually that's not for fresh graduates, right? Usually they work a few years, they want in work into they want to in, get into the marketing uh, and sales of medical device technology. And these are not 
just use car salesman type, right? They need to know what they are doing, right? Because oftentimes they go with the team to try to sell and market their product to, to hospital, to doctors, etc. So they need a lot of technical uh, uh, questions to be answered. And then every year we have maybe one or two in recent years that wants to go for further studies. Remember, we graduate technologists, diploma only, right? Some students want to, if they don't have a degree before they come in, they may want to get a degree, right? So, so there are some that want to go for further study. Um, now, two-year program, they only have one summer, right? Um, the summer, um, some students, they may say, well, I worked quite hard. I want to take a break in the summer, enjoy the summer. Uh, but some students want to get some money. So they may want to get a job. Um, we try to encourage our students, which in the first year summer, to get a job in related area of biomedical engineering. So that they earn a little bit of money and while well, they learn about what is the actual job like in a particular uh, uh, biomedical engineering company environment. Uh, so we try to facilitate the working. We, we, we are not a co-op program, right? So we don't uh, uh, arrange co-op for the student, but we try to facilitate them to get a job. So if company wants to hire uh, a sort of a, a student from our program, we'll help them to pose, we'll help them to uh, uh, do interviews or whatever. So the hospital, for example, hire quite a number of our students. Um, so I would say on average, uh, 50, 60% of our, of our students get a summer job in the related area. Um, last year, actually there are more summer jobs than, than our students want to work. Now, I, when, while we are talking about job, I like to ask Sunny Bath, uh, who is the manager of the uh, Low Mainland Biomedical Engineering Department, which basically VGH, uh, Fraser Health, and those uh, hospital, Memorial Hospital, right? It's called We Call Low uh, Mainland Biomedical Engineering. So Sunny is a manager for site operation and regional initiatives. And she is also a grad from our program. She will talk about what, what is the job about in a hospital setting? So Sunny, you should be able to uh, share your screen. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay, let me see. I, th I think you have to... Um... I already allowed you to do oh, there that. There it is, I see it, thank okay. you. Okay, if not, then I can actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm so just gonna get this going and... Are you okay? Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Are you seeing my notes or are you guys seeing my um nope. my actual presentation? No. Not seeing either yet. Oh, okay. Just seeing the regular Just screen. Business. So you type share yep. and you have to also click on the red button share. Let's see if this works. Gave this a try yesterday to see if it would work. If not, I can actually for my version. How's that? And um, Anthony, can you see that now? Can you guys see my screen? Mm, no. 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 No, why is it? Yeah, I don't know. Hitting you screen share. To... Yeah. I'll oh, even here we go. Oh, there you okay, go. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's working running now. <laughs> see my notes, so that's the only kicker. Well, you guys can see my notes. <laughs> it, it's it's not too exciting so um well, let me introduce you, myself okay that's good yeah no, yeah no. we can do that uh, i don't need to see my notes that's okay uh i will start by introducing myself um uh thank you anthony my name is sunday bath and i am a manager with a lower mainland biomedical engineering um my portfolio is more specific to supporting 
Providence Healthcare, which would be the biggest uh, hospital is St. Paul's Hospital. And then also um, I look after what we call the coastal community of care, which uh, includes Lionsgate Hospital, Sea to Sky, and then all the way up to Bella 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 Coola, and also um, sites within the First Nations Health Authority that we've partnered with. Um, oh, Brian just went off camera. I was going to introduce Brian. Um, Brian is um, my colleague working with me at Lower Mainland Biomedical Engineering. He is our education coordinator. Um, Brian, do you want to give a quick introduction to yourself? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I choked myself. Sorry. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Brian Lee. I'm one of the senior lead technologists here in our main and environmental things department. Uh, to be to be sophisticated. Uh, my, my role is an education coordinator, so I'm in charge of training patients to biomedical technologists. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Um, and as Anthony mentioned, both of us are, are grads from BCIT, um, and now we, we work within the healthcare system, so we're not in the private sector. Uh, just to give you guys a quick introduction to who we are as Lower Mainland Biomed, uh, we are a consolidated um, program. So we uh, provide services in hospital settings, acute care settings, from all four health authorities. So that includes Fraser Health, that includes Providence Healthcare, uh, Vancouver Coastal, as well as uh, pr uh, provincial health services. So we we're quite proud to say that we provide services basically all the way from Hope, all the way up to Bella 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 Coola now. So we have a quite uh, a large geographical area that we cover. We do roughly uh, have about 190 frontline technologists. So what that means is all the grads that came, uh, all, majority of our grads are, 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 sorry, our technologists are from BCIT. And those are the frontline technologists that are doing the hands-on work that are actually working with all the devices every single day. Um, and then we have obviously uh, additional support staff. So like myself, managers, directors, executive directors, and we also do have a clinical engineering team. And that was where Anthony was talking more about um, you know, people that have gone to school specifically outside of BCIT, so have either their master's in, in biomedical engineering. So there, if you put it into relevance, we have 190 frontline technologists that have graduated mostly from BCIT. And then we have a group of six uh, clinical engineers that have either gone through like a university accredited program. Just wanted to put that into perspective for you guys. Um, our department covers uh, 27 acute hospitals throughout uh, the Lower Mainland and over 100,000 medical devices. So all the way from thermometers, little handheld thermometers, um, you know, when you go into the doctor's office and they, they test your temperature, all the way up to what Anthony showed, MRI machines or CT scanners. So we have a very large range of medical devices that we uh, provide service for. Um, and a lot of it isn't just uh, repairs. We do quite a lot of um, consultation with uh, the clinical areas. So basically, we do the whole maintenance of a medical device from the entire life cycle. So starting from when they're thinking about it, like, oh, I think I need to purchase uh, a medical device in order to do a certain procedure. We come in right from there where we will work with the clinicians to help navigate the conversations of what they're looking for, what kind of specifications, what kind of device they're actually looking for. And then once it actually comes into the hospital, that's when we uh, kick into gear where we're responsible for installing it, responsible for repairing it, responsible for maintaining it um, to ensure that it's safe for use throughout the hospital and throughout its, its entire life cycle. And then at the back end, when it's ready for retirement, we all know devices can only have uh, so much of a lifetime. So uh, we come in and we help um, retire the device, safely dispose of the device, but then also restart that cycle again, because now we need to purchase a new piece of equipment. So it's just an ongoing cycle um, where we're working very closely with the clinical areas. And sorry, Brian, I forgot to mention, just jump in whenever you, you feel like um, you want to give a... Uh, additional context to my chat. Yep. Um, and what I wanted to share with you guys now was uh, there is a quick video, and I don't know if um, a lot of you had an opportunity to to see this. It was uh, a spotlight that was done on our department from Global News. 
And uh, it really, I think, uh, speaks and gives a really good insight into what we do as a department. So it's a short video. It's about two minutes. And I was just going to play that for you guys now. Um, see if this works. There. From device modifications to circuit board soldering, it is a part of the medical system we rarely get to see. But in the basement of VGH is where you will find the biomedical engineering department, a team of 40, including technologists like Helen Rong, who long dreamed of working in a hospital. I want to be a doctor and nurse one day to save people's life, because I saw that's the only two types of people working in the hospital. But when I go up, I notice there are a lot of technologists behind the curtain, like us. In the same way that doctors and nurses care for, treat and diagnose their patients, Helen and her colleagues do the same, but for all the medical equipment in the hospital. It is incredibly important work when you consider that this interoperative monitoring system helps prevent possible nerve damage during surgery. As a biomedical engineering technologist, um, we are responsible for the life cycle of the medical equipment here. And that means stretching the life of some pretty costly equipment. We see ourselves as stewards of public funding and being able to, to uh, stretch the lifespan of these devices as much as possible to make the best use of, out of our limited funding. As the manager of the biomedical engineering team, Pej Nemshirin sees his department growing as we become more reliant on medical technology. But like many professions, they aren't getting enough qualified applicants. He urges those who like to think outside the box to consider biomedical engineering. It's a field of constant learning and, and growth. Every time a new device machine comes on to the market, it's through years and years of uh, research and development. And for us to be able to learn about that and put it into service uh, alongside the clinicians is, is a very rewarding part of the job. And while they may not be on the front lines, their role is critical to the overall medical system. There we go. Um, yeah, so that was a, just a brief insight into what we do every single day. Um, and I think it gives a good overview of it, uh, what, our, what our role is within the healthcare system. And I always got asked, like when I first started as a biomed, like, oh, I didn't know that that was actually something that I could do. And a lot of the nurses would be like, yeah, so you're the person that when I put a not working sign on something, and then it magically disappears, and it comes back fixed, like, you're that person that fixes it. And so I think a lot of people just don't realize that this field exists. And similar to like, what Helen was saying, it's it's something that everybody thinks, oh, if I'm going to go into the healthcare field, I'm going to work as a nurse or a doctor. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an unknown field, um, which I think we have a lot of opportunity to grow into. Uh, for us, Anthony, uh, we've been working very closely uh, with BCIT is because we're just seeing such an unprecedented number of vacancies within our department. Um, and, you know, those are one due to obviously we're, we're seeing a lot of retirements that are coming um, uh, with our workforce. We also, as you guys uh, know, there's such a heavy um, redevelopment in healthcare right now. Um, you know, there's new hospitals that are being built. There's a new St. Paul's Hospital that's just being currently built. Uh, RCH, Royal Columbian Hospital is in redevelopment. There's a new Surrey Hospital that's going to be built. So there's just such a need and all of those facilities are going to have medical equipment that needs to be maintained and repaired. And so we're going to be looking to onboard additional staff um, from within our um, department. And we have uh, really not been able to recruit a lot of um, uh, staff to be able to join us because of, uh, I, I guess, uh, just the, sorry, the difficulty with having um, students going into the program. So we are trying to work very closely with Anthony to, to buffer that up. Um, the, I guess the other thing I would like to share with you guys is um, since, two, since June 2018, uh, our department has hired 62 new um, staff members. So if you were to look at our entire staff force, that's um, about 35% new staff. And uh, that's not even including the need that's coming on board now with all the redevelopments. 
So we're continuously looking to hire. Um, just since last year, so June of last year, we've hired 18. Um, thanks, Anthony. We've hired 18 um, new staff members. So we're really, really looking um, for technologists, uh, for, for Anthony's program to be graduating technologists, and we wait until June. And then uh, we usually end up having a very um, successful, uh, what we call uh, hiring intake at the end of uh, June, where we will hire um, pretty much as many techs that Anthony can get out to us um, through our hiring process to start hit the ground running um, and working with us. So this is just a quick overview and you guys can read it, but uh, the wage scale um, currently has just been renegotiated with the Health Sciences Union. So all our technologists are part of the Health Sciences Union. So they're protected uh, with a great uh, union that uh, represents them. First year, um, as soon as they get hired with us, they'll be walking in uh, making you know $37 an hour, pretty much right off the bat. Uh, that also includes a very substantial benefits package. So a very, very well dental and medical uh, package that helps uh, provide coverage for them. Uh, you also get 20 days of vacation right off the bat, and then one day for each five years of service after that. Um, we are one of the, I want to say, very unique uh, healthcare sectors where we only work Monday to Friday, eight to four. Um, you know, there's opportunity. Some, some technologists work seven to three. There's a little bit of flexibility, but our business hours are eight to four. We don't work evening shifts. We don't work uh, rotating shifts. Um, you know, your weekends are off. So we think we have a very, very good work-life balance from within our department. Um, uh, can you move to the next slide there, Anthony? Yeah, so uh, the other thing, our department is very well, um, which I, I'm biased, obviously, in saying this, but uh, for uh, personal and professional development, uh, there's a lot of on um, in-house training and factory training that once we, we hire you into our department, we'll be sending you out for training. Um, Brian is in charge of majority of that training, so he uh, works very closely with our technologists to send them out on training. Um, we're a very inclusive department where I, I write emotionally and physically safe. Uh, we try to work really closely with our staff to understand and be flexible with their work-life balance. Um, so we try to accommodate them as much as we can uh, within our department. And uh, there's also many, many opportunities of um, advancement within our, in our department. So both uh, Brian and I started off as frontline technologists He's moved up into his educator role. And Brian, how long have you been with the department now? Um, four years and Biomed itself, um, eight years. Yeah, so within eight, eight years, he's moved up um, from a frontline technologist into an educator role. And obviously with that comes a wage increase and responsibility. Uh, I've been with um, the department now for 18, 19 years started off as a frontline tech and I've moved from frontline tech to a supervisor to now a manager. And I was also fortunate enough that um, uh, LMBME supported me to go back to school to do my master's uh, while I was working full-time. So tons of opportunities for um, professional and personal development throughout our department. So I guess at the end of the day, we're just, we're looking for eager uh, students to come and join us. And I think I spoke to this one, just the unprecedented number of vacancies. Um, I think I could share with you, Anthony. So we just had our posting update go out today and uh, we had 15 postings go up for our staff, internal for our staff to be able to hire, uh, to slot into. Some of them are just temporary uh, postings because we've had people move into different positions or be on leave, but um, that speaks to how many vacancies we currently have. Yeah, okay. So if you offer a sign up bonus, I'll be happy. <laughs> um, a few things that I would like to um, share as well is um, the program itself really sets you up for the job. Um, I got my first job um, after two months uh, since the graduation. And my first job was actually in Comox, BC, a small city on um, Vancouver Island. Um, it's funny because uh, in the hospital, there, sh there should have been two technologists working in the hospital, but one was on a mad leave and one was on a sick leave. And on my first day, I was the only one. Um, 
nevertheless, um, I actually did not have any issues um, starting my first day because I already knew what I was supposed to do. And yeah, I, I was able to survive my first day without any orientations or instructions. So that really speaks a lot that the program really sets you ready for the job. And like Antti mentioned, uh, many of my um, friends who graduated with me um, got into manufacturing and got into device research and designs, got into the hospital. So there are lots of paths um, after graduation. And as a perspective of a technologist, um, like every day, um, it's different. Um, we we basically take care of a lifespan of a medical device from purchasing, installation, maintenance, repairs, upgrades, um, updates, and decommission, and then repeat, basically, right? So every day is different. One day I work on the ventilator, next day I work on the defib, and the next day I work on an incubator. And the next thing I know, I become a um, specialist to work on all the devices in the hospital, right? And also, like Sandeep mentioned, there's always room to grow and learn. Just last week, I was able to train a um, pen technologist on anesthesia machine. So always a lot of room to grow. Okay, so, well, thanks, Sandeep and Brian. Uh, talking about um, graduation, right? You can get a job right away. Uh, but also, we try to set up some lettering pathway for our grads. So that if they want more education, uh, they can move on, right? Um, so what are the lettering opportunity after they finish the diploma? Um, we sort of consider there's two stream, management stream and engineering stream. So what are they? The management stream is primary for these uh, grads that they work for a number of years and they want to become manager supervisors. And because of the two years uh, uh, of very compact uh, education and training, we don't have any management courses like a finance management course or whatever in our program. So to move up to a manager, director, supervisor, they need some of these uh, other, other knowledge and skills. So at BCIT, we have a Bachelor of Technology in Technology Management is a degree bachelor degree, uh, which our grads can go right in. And the beauty of this uh, degree is it is a part-time study uh, program. So what it means is our grad can work while taking this particular program. So it may stretch out to three, four years or even five before they finish the degree, but they can do it while they're working, still earning incomes. And then after that, uh, PCID has an agreement with SFU. They can get a master of uh, sort of an MBA degree in master of technology management from SFU. So they uh, have the degree basically save one year of the MBA training. So for those who are interested to become a professional engineers, not, well, not a technologist, then uh, within BCIT, again, we have a Bachelor of Technology in Electronic, which is accredited, sort of almost accredited by the professional association. So the only thing is within their study at BCIT, they need to write a couple of exams, which is admitted to serve within BCIT, within the Bachelor of Technology program. Again, this program is part-time program. So after finish this program, they would, uh, the grad will get a degree, a uh, bachelor degree in, uh, in electronics, which is eligible to become a professional engineer. Um, and then if a student come in already have a degree, right? Many of quite a number of our grads who has a degree before they come in, uh, got into the UBC Master of Engineering in Environmental Engineering. Um, so these pathways of what we talk about actually is quite popular for our grads if they want to get further education and then move on in their career. Uh, but one look is, is the transfer is not automatic. So they need to apply, for example, to be in this technology management degree, which most of our grad apply. If they got a decent GPA, they will get it, right? So it's not, not automatic transfer. Now, who are the sort of the, the, the student 
uh, in our program, right? This is just some of our observation and idea, right? So uh, an individual who are interested in technology and life sciences, right? Uh, some, some, some kids, they just want, I want to be in engineering. I don't want to be uh, doing anything with life sciences, working in hospitals, so that, that rule out them, right? But some who are interested in technology as well as life sciences will be suitable candidate. They are curious about how things work from a technology and design perspective, because we are working on medical device technology, right? Designing, manufacturing, and supporting them. Also enjoy working with people in multidisciplinary team environment. Because in healthcare, right? You work with doctors, you work with nurses, you work with all the allied health people. And if you are in design of medical devices, it's not just yourself that was you sitting on the bench. You usually it's a teamwork, right? You have engineers, you have technologists, you have these clinical people that works together and to design, develop new medical device. So you need to be a team player and also want to develop the creative thinking and problem solving skills. That is a very important aptitude in, in, in biomedical engineering. Um, admission, um, we only have one intake per year in September. So the admission will start in October in the prior year. Uh, we have two deadlines. One is February 15, one is May 15. So we will try to accept students who put in their application early uh, by around end of February or early March, right? We usually try to assign 50% of our seat. Uh, by the way, I don't think I've mentioned, we take in 32 students every year. So it's not a big number of students that we take in. Um, and then uh, May 15 is the cut deadline for everyone. So after May 15, we will not entertain any late applicants. So we will accept all the entire 32 seats and then they will start in September. Uh, what are the entrance requirements? Actually, um, basically it's high school graduation with English 12, uh, pre-calculus or math 12, chemistry and physics. So these are the minimum entrance requirements. And also we, in recent couple of years, we asked students to do this capsule test, which is an online test. You pay a small amount of fee. How much is it, Nikki? You know? Okay, anyway, I think it's 10. They did a Casper. Yeah, Casper. Um, I Casper. think it's only, it's not very much. I think it's, it's 50 something dollars, dollars, 60 dollars. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So capsule test is a very common test for they call situation judgment test is for medical school application, nursing school application, etc. It's a is a test that sort of well uh, different scenarios basically test their uh, how they behave, how they handle situation. So it's an online test that has multiple test dates throughout the the admission uh, framework. Um, and then student need to. A uh, complete immunization review form to because we are in healthcare, so uh, there are some immunization that they need to do before they can actually work in during the practicum or or be employed in the hospital setting. So these are the entrance requirement, which is basically all the high school students should be should be eligible in science, uh, etc. Now we do have. Uh, are in the, what we call the competitive model of admission, because we have a lot of application. And we try to select those we consider will be the most successful. So it's not first come first serve. So the two deadlines, especially the last one, we'll look at all the say entrance uh, marks, the high school marks, as well as we, um, also sort of like if a person graduated from high school 20 years ago, well, they need to do some refresher before we accept them because that will make them more difficult to, to handle the workload when they first, when they came into the program. And also, uh, if an if a, if a applicant has some post-secondary education, we give a little bit of, of advantage for these uh, 
uh, people with a degree or some post-secondary education. So they have some sort of scoring uh, rubric, and then we, we, we sort of look at these as uh, admission criteria. Okay, I guess that's the end of my talk. So whatever question you have, um, you can freely ask, and then we can see if we can answer or, or discuss. Yes, George. Okay, um, uh, thank you, first of all, uh, for the presentation. That was really good. Uh, a couple of my questions that I had already lined up uh, were answered, which is great. Um, and yeah, to learn about the industry and what's there for benefits and all that sort of stuff is also very good information. So I thank all presenters for that, including yourself, Andrew, Sundeep, uh, Brian, and others. Um, I do have three questions. I think two are really geared towards maybe Aaron, uh, whom I think I saw uh, still online. I don't know if Carol is still here or not. Carol um, did have to leave for another meeting. Yeah, no worries. Um, Aaron, any discussion about micro-credentialing in respect to this program? Um, Anthony might be able to answer that. None that I know of. Um, we are still discussing our pre-health program. We're waiting on government approval at the moment. That was supposed to come actually a few months ago. Uh, and Carol's been uh, working on that. I don't want to say badgering on that, but she's pretty much been, you know, trying to get that answer going. Um, and they have told us that they will have an answer for us, hopefully this summer. Uh, so we still are discussing pre-health program, but uh, nothing specific to biomedical engineering, unless Anthony has something that he hasn't told me yet. Well, we 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 have been thinking about micro credentials or, or these uh, badges or whatever, uh, but we haven't launched anything yet. Uh, but what we are considering at the moment is not for people who doesn't have any background in biomedical engineering, but instead uh, our grads, after they graduated, there are new technology often, uh, new new areas of, for example, AI, for example, cyber, cyber security, right? Those areas that when they were in at BCIT, well, it, there's none of this at the moment. So in order for them to learn continuous professional development, we are considering putting some of these as micro-credentials or, or, or badges, right? For But we also, a lot of times, right, uh, uh, do industry services workshop, for example, we'll be running network cybersecurity workshop for people working in the field, right? So that's right. something that we, we are constantly doing. Yeah. So to be clear, once again, when it comes to the micro-credentialing, you're looking more for graduates that have those, that experience within your diploma and potentially degree programs in respect to assistance there, as opposed to high school students and having an effective way to try and ladder into uh, this diploma program. Oh, uh, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But, okay. but that's an idea that I think we have to think about if there's a real need, uh, if we have manpower and, and resources to do that. But I think that's, that's a, a good question as well. Right. We, we are, George, I know we talked about this earlier yeah. too um, in person uh, back in the fall, and we are still having discussions within BCIT about how we can do uh, a bundled set of health prerequisites for a number of our programs. The thing yeah. is that Anthony's program doesn't actually require any uh, post secondary prerequisites. Uh, so students are definitely yeah. able to apply from this straight out yeah. of high school. And he did say that people who have some education have an advantage. That does not mean that you can't get in from high school. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's exactly what I was trying to say. Um, yeah. Well, high school students with these science subjects can get in, right? But mm. some may find it more challenging than others, right? For example, in electronics, in, in some, some areas. But once you're a student accepted into our program, we want everyone to be successfully graduated. So within students in our program, we try to put in a lot of effort and resources to help the student to, to learn and to upgrade and, and complete the program. Okay. So if you if some students look at our program and say, well, I'm not sure whether I can handle that. 
tell the student, don't worry, right? If they really want to be in this profession, if they want to be in this particular career path, get in, and then we'll try to help them as much as possible. Great. Okay. Uh, second question, possibly also for yourself, uh, Anthony, um, the five-week practicum in the second year, paid or unpaid? It's unpaid. Okay. Just making, um, just making sure of that. It's unpaid. The, well, one of the reasons we, we don't try to uh, ask some site, although some actually offer to pay our students, uh, we try to not get them, not encourage them to pay uh, because we want to make sure that this is a learning uh, uh, environment for our students. It's not something that they, the student actually work for them, right? Mm -hmm. So our student, I told a student, well, don't be afraid if you make mistake. Don't be afraid if you don't know how to do anything, right? Because all the site has uh, have full understanding that our student there is for learning their student. They are not workers. Whereas yeah. if they got a job in the summer, that's totally different. We have students hired in the hospital. They are they are expected to be productive to do some work for the hospital or for the company. So oh. that's totally different. Yep. No, fair enough. I understand that. The last question, if I beg the indulgence of the crowd here, um, really deals, I think, with yourself, Anthony, because of your PhD standing and maybe taking a 30,000 foot view of things. But uh, Sun, uh, Sandeep and Brian are more than welcome to jump in on this as well. And you did kind of allude to the aspect of AI and the role of AI. We know AI is growing out there. It's undoubtedly going to affect things when it comes to technology in hospitals, technology at home. Uh, when we are advising students in respect to the future, and if you take out your crystal ball, like is this, is this development going to make it so that it's, um, fewer jobs could be happening, or is this just going to be an increase in jobs because of more of the reliance on AI? It, or is it just like, we just can't tell at this point? What are your thoughts? Okay, I'll make a comment afterwards, but I'll leave this to see if any other people want to chip in first. Very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Brian, you, you unmuted first, go for it. Yeah, um, as a technologist who worked on ventilators, anesthesia machine, defibrillator, they're life critical. And sometimes the device itself can mean life or death. Um, with that perspective, um, with the reliability issue, um, I, I really think that this job is not replaceable by AI or um, any sort of um, artificial <laughs> technologies, in, in my opinion. Um, recently, there was a conference uh, for, for uh, biomedical engineering. Um, one of the topic was actually AI. And uh, one of the discussion was that AI might be replacing um, the jobs for radiolo radiologists or, or the doctors who review the extra images, basically. But even then, um, one of the, 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 the comment was that AI can be a tool to act as a backup and provide advices and provide ideas, but it will never be um, our first choice of um, decision-making, basically. Okay. Well, AI is a tool. I look the way I look at it, right? At least at the moment, like 50 years later, don't know, right? Now, AI is a term like we long time ago, even though when I was in my well, university first degree, right? We have computer learning, we have machine learning, we have deep learning, we have neural network, and now basically people are calling it AI, right? Because there are some, the computer can do some interpretation and come up with some maybe better idea or whatever. Right, that sort of mimic the the brain of the of the human being. Now, this this is sort of a tool that like technology change all the time and evolve. Right, if you think about you, we used to. I don't know whether George, you you have experienced what we call typing pool. 
right? sorry people that typing pool word processing department yes. right yeah. typist right they go to some school and learn about typing right it's all gone now right because of the technology right so radiology um brian mentioned right ai radiologist a big part of the jobs uh, for most of them is to review x-ray images and they try to detect if there's a bone break if there's a tumor or whatever that is actually even proven to be better done by machines that look at it and able to detect this morphology or whatever more accurately more efficiently so if you talk about radiologists right people say well the professional radiologists will be gone because of AI, but you need to adapt, right? There are other jobs of radiology, radiologists, for example, interventional radiologists, you still cannot be replaced by a machine or whatever, right? So, so the job keep evolving. Now we bring it back to biomedical engineering technology, right? Um, what can an AI do? AI may be able to make it easier to troubleshoot diagnostic part, diagnose problem. But who is going to actually do the repair work, right? Well, maybe 50 years later, that can be a robot to take apart the machine and put in uh, the proper replacement parts or whatever. But if nowadays for, for the near future, you still need biomedical engineering technologists to do this hands-on work, right? And also you need people to actually design program this AI and whatever tools for in biomedical engineering. So the job will sort of the learning, the knowledge, the job nature will evolve to meet the needs of the time, right? With the uh, evolution of technology. So I hope that answers your questions. So I yeah. don't think the biomedical engineering technologist work will be replaced or reduced. And I would just, yeah, add to that, Anthony, I think it'll be a tool in our toolbox to use yeah. moving forward. Um, but there's such a big part of our job, yeah. um, communicating with yeah. clinical um, practitioners that I don't think AI would be able to yeah. replace, right? So, you know, when there's a nurse in an OR trying to fix a piece of equipment because it's not working, she can't get it up and running where the the face that shows up and kind of brings the the room down so i just don't see ai being able to replace that personal uh connection that we have and how embedded we are in uh the healthcare setting like you know we're just not sitting at our workbenches working away on devices we're actually in the clinical areas interacting now we we will be introducing more and more ai sort of concept or tools in our in our programs just just uh Two, three weeks ago, I invited a guest speaker come in to talk to our student about AI application in medical radiology, actually. <laughs> And, and with AI comes obviously cybersecurity concerns, which is a huge growing field that biomedical engineering is now moving into networking. Like these are all fields that didn't exist when I went through the program, but now it's evolving to include those. So I just see our field changing. Maybe the, the scope of our practice may include more um, working with AI, but I don't see it replacing us. Well, the one of the beauty of this program and the, the career is if you want to talk to us, get back to us, your student is, well, the technology is always changing. But most of the employers, including big part of the hospital, they, want, they, are, they have no problem in investing in their employers, in employees. So they, they, have, they send their, their techs to uh, factory training in the States or overseas or a local keep on making sure that they are up to the current level, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in some jobs, right, you learn, right? For example, a typist, I say, well, you're typing, typing, all of a sudden the technology over actually comes and wiped out the entire profession, right? So, so as long as I can see, right, most of the employers are, are very willing to, to provide training, to upgrade the skills and knowledge of the employees in this field. Okay. Thank you all for your perspectives. Much appreciated. Okay. You're welcome. So I guess, well, if there's no other questions, 
uh, we'll wrap up this session. Thank you very much for attending. Come on, and well, the the idea well of organizing this is uh, to as teachers in the high school, right? We try to make sure that your student knows what what we can offer in biomedical engineering at BCIT. Okay, and if you have any question, if you have any colleagues that want to hear about, and then well, we can we can organize other session. Uh, originally, I was planning to have a lab tour, but like there's a cancel. But if any one of you are interested, give me a and send me an email. We can we can arrange a time for you to come in. Anthony, do you want to show the slide again with your email address and contact information? Oh, okay, okay. Go forward to that one. Yeah. And, well, you can go to go to um, Tech GB, uh, oh, Chat no, GB, <laughs> and GBT to look up Anthony Chan, biomedical engineer. <laughs> Anthony and, underscore Chan. Yeah, I I would just like to add Anthony. One other thing is, um, since we're we're a big employer, um of biomedical engineering technologists, we've actually been doing some high school outreaches. So myself, Brian, and um, Pej Namcharan, who wasn't here, but he was in one of the videos, uh, we've gone to multiple high schools throughout the Lower Mainland and done uh, a brief introduction to our department, what we do, what it's going to take um, for students to come into BCIT. So if anybody's interested in that, please feel free to reach out to us and um, we can come come do a, a little chat. I think it's a lot of it's been with like the science co-op students or more catered towards that. Um, but we're more than willing to be able to come out and visit you at your schools and uh, talk to the students. OK, great. Well, thank you very much. Have a nice weekend and stay in touch. Thank you.